solution uh, third stroke one was based on the report prepared by special investigation team ohchr that is what we call it established within the office of the high commissioner on human rights and the report prepared by the said team called oisl report having resisted three previous resolutions since uh, 2012 then sri lankan government decided to co-sponsor the resolution 30 stroke one that resolution had unprecedented 23 introductory paragraphs that set the stage, stages for 20 operational paragraphs filling five pages the text says the resolution was sponsored by macedonia montenegro the united kingdom northern ireland and the united states of america sri lanka is not a name in the text as a sponsor sri lanka representative in geneva we are fully aware that Ravinath Arya Singer refused to accept the resolution and tried to negotiate in different terms. However, Yahapalana government, the then Sri Lankan government, overruled the ambassador's objections and ordered him to accept the draft resolution just as it was. The resolution was passed without a vote because the Sri Lankan government uh, decided to co sponsor the resolution at the last stage. So why we are talking about this resolution now? To get the answer to that question, we look into the chronological events of the Sri Lanka's resolution 30 stroke one. Sri Lanka co-sponsored the resolution in October 2015 and UNHRC extended further two year period in 2017 to fulfill Sri Lanka's obligations, extended again in 2019 2019. In March 2020, Sri Lanka informed the Council that Sri Lanka is withdrawing from the co sponsorship. Sri Lankan Foreign Minister Dinesh Gunawardana, while addressing the Council during the March 2020 43rd session of the Council, officially informed the Human Rights Council on February 26 the government's decision to withdraw from the co sponsorship resolution 30 stroke 1. 34 stroke one and 40 stroke one. Bear in mind, though the government has withdrawn co-sponsorship of the resolution, it is effective until March, 2021. The other words, the government will have to face the UNHRC in regards to the resolution again in March, actually February, 2021. Question is, is the uh, question is, if uh, obligations set by the rights body are not fulfilled, will there be any consequences? While withdrawing co-sponsorship of the resolution 30 stroke one, government of Sri Lanka pledged to continue to work with the UN and seek capability building and technical assistance in keeping with domestic priorities and policies. So it is also announced uh, Sri Lanka's intention to work towards the closure of the resolution in cooperation with UN, which means the full withdrawal from the resolution. So this indicates one important point. Government had withdrawn from the co-sponsorship and seeking full withdrawal from the resolution, but still stick to work with UN. To understand this scenario, we must look in at the resolution and find out why Sri Lanka is withdrawing. Uh, why it is bad. It is, it is bad, that's why Sri Lanka is withdrawing. So why it is bad? Mainly because the resolution infringed upon the sovereignty of the people of Sri Lanka, as well as violated the basic structure of the Sri Lanka's constitution. While we have to bear in mind in uh, that the resolution 30 must so one is not a human rights resolution. It and is a political document. Why Sri Lanka? Tamil Sri Lanka. That is the 2000 resolution in recognition and the need subsequent for extensions to recognize 34 the need for a 2017 settlement 41 by which means 2019. the new constitution. Resolution uh, of the Sri Lanka. 30 stroke one was the resolution based on prescribes the, four specific actions the uh, Yahapalana government, then Sri Lankan government, has to take. Firstly, a judicial mechanism to in investigate allegations of violations and abuses of human rights. Secondly, 
a commission for truth justice reconciliation and non recurrence thirdly an office for missing persons and fourthly an office for reparations the resolution also permits the government to remove military officers suspected of having violated human rights even if there is no evidence there is no doubt that is that is one uh, promoting of the reconciliation forces. accountability and human rights so, in sri lanka uh, According that is the 2015 books of the UN resolution and Sri Lanka has signed extension until March 31 2017 to and 41 to the human rights council resolution uh, regarding the creation of program in base on the that means report that prepared by special investigation team OHC that is new strategy before the right body in the office of the high commissioner on human rights it's going to happen and the report prepared by the said uh, team called now we go into the possible scenarios having resisted three previous March resolutions 2021. since uh, 2012 there are few possibilities then sri lankan the government number decided one is the further time of the resolution 30 stroke 1 we will, we will that not resolution prior if this unprecedented it has been extended in introductory in paragraph 15, 15, that not only once the stage actually stages however for 20 operation paragraph the goal is in sri lanka score the text because sri lanka says already in the resolution was of their sponsored by Macedonia, Montenegro, so the Sri United Lanka Kingdom, cannot Northern agree Ireland, and for the United States another of extension, America, which is, Sri Lanka in fact, is contradicting themselves. A name possibility number in the two. text as a sponsor. Possibility number Sri two Lanka is representing recommending in sanctions on Sri Lanka. We are fully aware that, that is also RSA unlikely in my opinion. Refused to accept the resolution uh, unlikely scenario because she had for so many reasons. Terms. UNHRC However, itself has no jurisdiction to impose government. sanctions. Overrule However, the ambassador's objection. They can recommend to the order UN him to accept the draft resolution on individual just basis. as it was. With the their own discretion to take without action. a vote. Because this is similar to sanctions imposed of, by uh, US to Iran, Chinese officials and companies last and US, uh, So UK why we are talking about this Russian resolution officials. now? Most importantly, it must be remembered that, that question, uh, resolution we look of the Human Rights Council is not events of the Sri Lanka's resolution. There is no obligation on the part of Sri the Lanka target country, country to the resolution give in October 2015 to the and UNHRC uh, to such a resolution for the two-year period in 2017. A Human Rights Council resolution Sri is binding on the Human Rights Commissioner and the Secretariat, but not on member states of UN. one must remember that even a resolution of the united nations general assembly is not binding the freedom of action of the high commissioner pursuant to a council resolution is limited by what the target country would allow him to do within its jurisdiction the importance of the high commissioner has been uh, sorry um, uh, in capacity and the importance of the high commissioner has been demonstrated Iran, Israel, Belarus, uh, Syria had many resolutions adopted against them, and they happily ignore this. There are many uh, such resolutions and reports produced by the High Commissioner, which are gathering dust in the Secretariat simply because the target countries have refused to cooperate. So UN UN action was now we go into the UN action. against sri lanka has been attempted the earlier un action has was attempted first time in 2007 uh, that was about the use of children in armed conflict preference is um, s 2007 758 security council was not very enthusiastic about this at that time so nothing has happened once again in 2009 as soon as the war ended these western countries stuck again they prepared with their un move ready to be used in case of the sri lankan government actually won the war which was a sound possibility at that time so in 2009 us working through britain france and austria trying to get the un security council to examine the deaths in the last stages of the elam war this was to be at a security council uh, briefing but us not able to secure the 16 signatures needed and uh, un security council refused to discuss the situation in sri lanka china vehemently opposed any discussion in the security council on the issue of civilians trapped in the fighting between the government security forces and the ltte 
arguing that it was purely an internal matter. The third possibility is to happen in 2021 March in the Human Rights Council is to co-group to bring a new resolution against Sri Lanka and or uh, Sri Lanka to produce a counter resolution. After 2015, co-group did not bother to bring a new resolution because Sri Lankan government co-sponsored the resolution. They took the co-sponsorship from the Sri Lankan side as an undertaking. They must have thought that uh, no matter how long it will take, as long as the Sri Lankan government is cooperating, finally. Now the co-sponsorship is over, so they can continue with the similar path they did with the Human Rights Council resolution in 2012, 2013, and 2014. However, there is a problem to bringing up a new resolutions because Sri Lanka is not, not sponsored in the resolution anymore. Uh, so the new one is going to be go on vote. The golden question is, would they be able to get the winning vote as they did in 2012, 2013, and 2014. Uh, all these resolutions were US-led resolutions. When US left the council, UK took over the responsibility and lead in the action group. If the core group on Sri Lanka is to bring new resolution, it is important to realize that it need pass through the 47 member states. It is obvious that the absence of the US in the United Nations Human Rights Council is going to make it difficult for the Sri Lankan Tamil lobby groups to get a resolutions against Sri Lanka passed in the March 2021 session of the council when the current resolution expires. When the US was there and, the, and sponsoring the resolution as it did between 2012 to 2014, they got sufficient votes. But since the US has opted out of the UNHRC, the onus of getting a resolution passed will be on less powerful countries. Uh, these do not have the cloud to get it passed. When the European Union wanted to sponsor, sponsor a resolution in 2012, it realized that it did not have enough backers in the council. So it backed out. It was only when the US took up the case in 2012 that the council could pass a resolution against Sri Lanka. Every time the US backed the resolution, it was passed. From 2015 onwards, till the previous government uh, fell in 2019, Sri Lanka co-sponsored the resolutions against, it, against itself and they were passed without a vote. So, there is no guarantee that it will be passed. Therefore, the chance to receive a new resolution is very low. Still, even if they bring a resolution against Sri Lanka, can bring a counter resolution, then the Sri Lanka can bring a counter resolution to defeat it as they did in 2009. To do this, Sri Lanka must lobby 47 countries and get the required number of votes to defeat it. This is most interesting story about the uh, counter resolutions about in Sri Lanka, in regards to Sri Lanka. In May 2009, a UN Human Rights Council in Geneva held a special, uh, special session called at the request of the US, UK, and EU, Denmark to discuss a Swiss EU resolutions against Sri Lanka. The sponsor was the United States, and the resolution was known as the US resolution on Sri Lanka to request for convincing the special uh, session was made by the Germany on the 19th of May, the very day hostilities in Sri Lanka came to an end. The initiative for the resolution, however, was taken by the European Union. The resolution called for a comprehensive international investigation of the conduct of Sri Lankan forces in the last phase of war. Both government and LTTE were accused of killing thousands of civilians according to the resolution. The reference is AHRC RES S uh, slash level. Uh, Switzerland had brought amendments to the Sri Lanka's resolution at Sri Lanka, resolution against Sri Lanka at a closed door meeting held earlier. The EU was very secretive in its actions. EU was trying for a war crime probe. Uh, that was the understanding at that time. 
the eu assumed that the, they uh, since they were about a dozen themselves they could get the 16 signatures easily but the attempt was failed eu was not able to secure the 16 signatures needed sri lanka briefed all states interested in sri lanka and got the motions stretched the non ally movement its chairman cuba and chairman elect egypt as well as china russia bangladesh and pakistan supported sri lanka sri lanka then submitted a counter resolution uh, counter resolution is uh, to the eu resolution resolution s11/1 uh, the the title was assistance to sri lanka the assistance to sri lanka in the promotion and protection of human rights the resolution showed that ltt kept civilians as hostages against their will and the government liberated almost 300000 civilians kept by the ltt the resolution was commended the resolution was passed by 29 for the 12 against and 6 abstaining those who voted for sri lanka includes india pakistan china russia malaysia brazil cuba egypt ghana indonesia sri lanka counter resolution was described as a rare and uh, perhaps presidented move by an analyst uh, so uh, there could not be a similar instance of uh, human rights council history uh, said the jubilant sri lankan group so finally uh, in our point of view what sri lanka should do it is clear that the sri lanka's foreign minister by realizing the reality even after the withdrawal from the co sponsorship correctly stated to the council that sri lanka remains committed to achieving the goals set by the people of sri lanka on accountability and human rights also he said to that the that accountability towards the sustainable peace and reconciliation adding sri lanka will seek to work towards the closure of the resolution as the foreign minister correctly stated to find find the home grown solution to overcome contemporary challenges in the best interest of sri lanka so the sri lankan government committed themselves even at the withdrawal of the co sponsorship therefore it is the government's duty come up with a good solid home grown proposal by 2021 march session starts i'm going to uh, conclude uh, my speech Uh, repeating what uh, distinguished our today our today's our distinguished uh, uh, speaker right honorable lord ness be stated stated once in house of lords right the honorable lord ness be stated in reality sri lanka has taken positive steps on the four pillars of transitional justice truth reconciliation accountability and guarantees of non recurrence which must be taken into account by the human rights council uh, it is just 10 years since the end of the war surely now is the time for closure and let the proud country stand on its own two feet that is what uh, lord nesby right honorable lord nesby stated uh, earlier in the house of lords um, i'm finishing my speech now thank you very much Thank you so much, Jaraj, for laying down the background of Resolution 30/1 and opening the topic for discussion. Um, to save time, I thought of um, uh, skipping the initial questions. Is that okay, Jaraj? And move on to our keynote speaker. It is. Uh... So let me introduce our keynote speaker next. um it's lord michael nesby who has a long relationship with sri lanka that spans for more than 50 years sri lankans first got to know him as a marketing manager in the famous firm of uh, rakit and colman in 1963 his political career starts after he gets elected as the conservative mp for northampton south electorate soon afterwards he established the first all party sri lanka parliamentary group in 1975 and lord ness base currently uh, a life peer of house of lords in my personal opinion i don't think there's any other british politician more knowledgeable and more loved by sri lankans than lord ness base 
Sri Lanka Ratna Award he received from the government of Sri Lanka in 2005 is living proof of this appreciation. His trailblazing work on exposing lie of Tamil genocide is how I got to know him first. He provided objective evidence to show that the real number of war casualties is far less than the number claimed by pro-LTT propaganda. He makes a powerful plea for reconciliation between those on opposing sides as a basis for lasting peace and stability. Interestingly, he has managed to present his ventures with Sri Lanka into a book which highlights his observations on the war between Sri Lankan government and the LTT rebel tigers, as well as post-war allegations against the armed forces. I would strongly recommend to all of you to buy this very useful book and read it. And I have um, seen some of the participants have already made comments that they have read it uh, even in Sri Lanka. The book is called Sri Lanka, Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained. Please join me to only welcome the Right Honourable Lord Nesby. Well, thank you very much. And can I say a welcome to uh, friends in the UK, anybody else who's overseas, and particularly Canada, where I had the privilege of training as an RAF pilot for two years, uh, mainly in the prairies at a place called Moose Jaw. Um, I've always felt that uh, we need to say very clearly and very strongly what the actual position was on the war. It was not a human rights war. It was a proper plain war between a democratically elected government and some terrorists, in this case, the LTTE. And there was no higher legal person than Sir Desmond de Silva, the UN special rapporteur, or the late Desmond, who made it quite clear that it was the law of armed conflict, international humanitarian law, that should be the judgment, and not human rights legislation. And we must keep hammering away on that point. Secondly, although it's hard for everybody, we do need to re-emphasize the atrocities that were undertaken by the LTTE. And number one sure in my list are people. the child soldiers. We know from UNICEF in July uh, of uh, 2005, that at that point, 5,081 underage recruitment uh, of young Tamil people had been taken into the army of Prabhakaran. They were called the Baby Brigade. And the person who was really almost certainly equally responsible for the recruitment and training was a Mrs. Balasingham, who still resides somewhere in the southern England. So that's point number one. Point number two, we need to emphasize the degree of ethnic cleansing that was undertaken prior to the war. In the period of 1990, October, when 75,000 Muslims were given 24 hours to get out of their home in Jaffna area, jewelry taken, money taken, and they were just sent south. Then the Sinhalese that used to live in the Jaffna province. What do we see? By the early 1880s, the census said that there were 19,000 334 Sinhalese. Go on to the next census, and there's hardly a Sinhalese person left. They've been persecuted out by the Tamil Tigers. And finally, in those sorts of numbers, nearly 300,000 Tamil civilians forced to leave their homes and become, in effect, a human shield for the LTTE. Thankfully, the vast majority of those survived, as we know from the ones that were uh, given rescue uh, in uh, a number of the places like Manic Farm. But it wasn't just that, was it? I had the idea, rather late on, I admit, that I'd asked to see Colonel Gash's dispatches. Colonel Gash 
was the UK's military observer representative in Colombo. I saw him in January 2009. I had no idea that he was going to go right up to the front, which he did. I had no idea he was going to send almost daily dispatches back on what was happening. So I put in a freedom of information request, turned down, not once, not twice, not three times, about five times. In the end, I got through with the help of the information commissioner. And it showed that the Sri Lankan army had taken great pains not to kill civilians. Now, this is an independent witness. This is not some lackey uh, from the, from the uh, Sri Lankan government or from anywhere else. This is a highly responsible senior army officer. And he lists the daily total of Tamil civilians who managed to get through the lines in the darkness and come over to the other side. Now, if you were a Tamil civilian and you thought you were going to be slaughtered by the Sri Lankan armed forces, you certainly wouldn't go overnight uh, and climb through the lines to get through to the other side, would you? And there were not just half a dozen doing it, some nights two or three hundred. And on one occasion, almost 5,000 of them. So there we have real evidence. Of course, when I look clear, closely at uh, the dispatches once I eventually got them, I found an enormous amount of redaction had taken place. Also, uh, there was nothing for the period of uh, May and only one for April. So I asked what had happened then. He hadn't gone abroad, had he? Of course he hadn't. Somehow they got lost in the foreign office. Well, that's what was claimed. At any rate, another four turned up. And now I have it in black and white. And there's one in my book, which shows quite clearly that uh, some of the elderly, some of the injured were taken off the beach, taken down to Trinco, and were looked after exceedingly well, according to Colonel Gas. So we got some real solid evidence. And you can go on from there. It is, was stated by, of course, the Tamil Tigers that, and their followers that President Raja Paxi had a stated policy to kill Tamil civilians. There's not a shred of evidence of that that I can find or anybody else can find. Secondly, there are no fire zones. They say, that is the Tigers, that that was a uh, policy to congregate civilians so they could be killed. But that's rubbish. The whole idea of a no-fire zone is that both sides should agree. It was uh, um, advised, uh, the offer was made uh, with and through the International Red Cross, but it was never accepted by the LTTE. And why didn't they accept it? Because had they accepted it, it would have negated the human shield that they brought with them of the poor civilians uh, in the uh, no-fire zone or no-fire zones. And worse still, they then put artillery in there and started firing at the incoming army of the Sri Lankans. So understandably, there were some casualties amongst the civilians. Then it was claimed that the government was going to starve the people out. Well, all of you know who know Sri Lanka know that there are a man or woman called a government agent. You know there are go-downs. And you know it's a rule of the, of the government agent, wherever they may be, that they should keep six months stock of key supplies, that's fuel, food, and medicine. And that's because of the monsoon and other uh, natural causes to make sure that there's always a backup. And lo and behold, when the war ended, there was food, medicine, and fuel in the go-down. Of course, it, did it go to the ordinary civilians well, only the LTTE can answer that. Maybe they did try and starve them, but it certainly wasn't the government of Sri Lanka. And there, and then there are these tales of the camp. Uh, my wife and I, my wife's a doctor, we went to Manic Farm. And I keep hearing from the human rights specialists that they should have been allowed in from the beginning. Well, the ICRC were in there from the beginning. That's the International Red Cross. They are a completely unbiased 
uh, organization who do wonderful work the world over. So it's not good enough for the Darsman report to say that these camps were virtually detention camps. Absolute rubbish. So we have to be strong. We have to keep repeating. I spent 20 years in the world of advertising alongside a very good, famous uh, Sri Lankan called Ananda de Alwis, who was also in advertising. And you have to keep repeating the story. So we move on. And uh, I've done extensive work on uh, the numbers killed. The numbers killed, roughly speaking, maybe 7,000, of which 25% will have been uh, LTTE uh, fighters. But I've also looked at the, the work on the satellite that was done. That doesn't show anywhere near that number. I've looked at all sorts of other evidence. I've looked at further evidence from the um, uh, the um, um, survey of uh, that's done regularly by the uh, government departments. This one was done by with Tamil people, and that doesn't show anything more uh, than around five, six thousand as uh, present uh, previously, and then uh, dead. So we have to challenge these things. And now we have a situation, as the previous speaker said, uh, that we are having another review that comes up. Well, uh, I think it's going to be quite difficult for anybody with a worldwide pandemic. And if I have one criticism of the recent uh, statement from uh, Geneva, it is that here we are with lockdown in the UK, or near enough lockdown, uh, Sri Lanka having lockdown, and I have to say handling the pandemic rather better than we are in the UK, that's number one problem today. It's not just Sri Lanka and London or UK. It's every country in the world. And we can't have somebody in Geneva pontificating that they want to see substantial progress in the next uh, four or five months. We've got to handle this pandemic first. And quite rightly, the government of Sri Lanka are saying that is key thing number one. Nevertheless, the new president has quite clearly said he wishes to seek peace and reconciliation across all communities. So what am I going to do to try and help a bit? I have booked a uh, slot for a one and a half hour debate that at, at, my, uh, at my timing uh, with the agreement of the House of Lords authorities between now and the end of April. So my guess is I'll seek this debate probably in January. Secondly, the Missing Persons Commission must press forward. And if I am a little bit critical, it's not pressed forward quick enough. It really needs to get going because that's the key. And there are people who are missing. We all know that. I would like the Sri Lankan government to ask the UK government to if necessary, on a confidential basis, I'd like the Sri Lankan government who have the names to release the names to the UK government, to the US government, the Canadian government, and other relevant governments, the names of the people who are missing. Because we've all seen Sri Lankans who allegedly were killed reappearing in varying places. So I think they should challenge these different countries that I've mentioned, where varying people went to, to have the list from Sri Lanka of who's missing and look at it for uh, people to come forward. And if they do come forward and say, no, there is a mistake, in which case uh, then, in which case then th there should be no follow up. Basically, we just say, okay, thank you for telling us you're now alive and well. So that's a key thing as far as I'm concerned. And uh, the other area is interesting, is that there is actually going on, and I have a cutting here in front of me, and this is an inquiry into the UK's involvement in 9-11 and rendition and alleged torture, etc. What I think the Sri Lankan government need to keep up to, up to speed on that. I think the Sri Lankan government uh, need to do that very much. 
Personally, I'm sure the Sri Lankan government can handle what's required. I think we should look at a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There is the most successful, we've had two, but the most recent one uh, is, the, is the one that took place in uh, South America with Colombia. Let's have a look at that and see whether we can tweak it to meeting the requirements of South Asia. And that was looked at by the UN and others and accepted. And that's where people give evidence on the basis that uh, uh, they may have undertaken uh, some things they shouldn't have done. And everybody uh, is then absolved unless they've been lying uh, all the way through. So I think uh, that's something else that could be considered. Um, and I think uh, from my viewpoint, these are things that are absolutely practical that can be done. But I re-emphasize that um, Sri Lanka is a democratic government, has a democratic government, better turnout than we have in, in the UK. And I think it's time that the diaspora did two things. I think it's time that they invested in Sri Lanka, uh, particularly in the northern region if they're Tamil. I think the, the, the funds of the LTTE, which were all ill-gotten gains through all sorts of illegal activities, I think they should be handed over to Sri Lankan charities. Um, and I think the diaspora should do that. Uh, and I think also uh, that we can re-emphasize that there never was any genocide at all of the Tamil people. Thank God there wasn't. And uh, I think if we did that, the Sri Lankan government can demonstrate that they are achieving reconciliation, accountability, and human rights. And no way can they or should the UNHCR interfere or try to micromanage that situation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Lord Nesby. I know all the participants will share my sentiments uh, when I say, why, why did Lord Nesby finish his speech so quickly? Um, but thank you so much for creating a strong pedestal to counter false allegations created by pro-LTT lobbies. It gives us all Sri Lankans strength to foil the separatist voices that we hear coming from the mouths of some powerful nations and organizations. There are a few burning questions um, um, to you, Lord Nesby, if I may. Uh, the first question comes from Mr. Sarat Chandrasekhar from Canada. He's asking, uh, you have been a strong advocate for Sri Lanka. Your facts and arguments are evidence-based. Have you received any feedback about your speeches and the book from the Tamil diaspora, like British Tamil Forum and TGT? If yes, what do they say? If no, why are they silent? The answer is no, I've heard nothing. Um, and I am a bit surprised um, because I put things down fairly bluntly. I'm quite careful. Uh, I don't uh, support any particular side. I support justice. Um, and uh, I would welcome someone to uh, comment from uh, the uh, Global Tamil Forum. Uh, I'll just say one other thing. I, we made a small breakthrough recently. You mentioned that I started in 1975 the All Party Sri Lanka group. And it was all party and it was all ethnic group as well. Unfortunately, one uh, lawyer called Keith Vaz decided that he wanted to start a new group. And that was in 2007 on the 30th of April. And he, that was when the Tamil group was set up. Now, and we've subsequently also had a Muslim group set up. Uh, I don't criticize that at all. And indeed, I'm the vice chairman of that. But I suggested at the AGM we had recently, of all the groups, that we should try and work together. And it was agreed that we would try and work together. Now, that is a small step forward, but it's a step forward. Thank you. I hope uh, Sarat got the answer. Uh, there is another question. Actually, the same question is coming from several participants. Um, Ajanta Premaratna from Dubai and uh, Margaret Ranger. They are asking, 
do you think the current British government will support Sri Lanka now? Uh, can we consider UK as a friendly country for Sri Lanka now? Well, I'm not sure. Um, I think they must be very wary, Sri Lanka must, because there's a, uh, a new uh, statutory instrument setting up called the Global Human Rights Sanctions Regulation 2020. And indeed, it's already been enacted against the uh, uh, someone in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, there is a faction, and uh, we have to remember that there are a number of parliamentary seats in the UK, uh, which are dominated by the Tamil diaspora. The Tamil diaspora in the UK are exceedingly active and put a lot of pressure on some members of parliament. So do I think the UK government could be uh, a conduit for automatic help? No. I think we have to uh, dialogue with them. And I say thank you to the government in Colombo for sending a high commissioner who's only been with us for a few months, but she's already showing initiatives and dialogue and good, well-brief presentations. That's uh, not what happened in uh, fairly recent times. So we have a good high commissioner, an active high commissioner here in London, and that is a great help. So, but it won't be an easy road. But we have some friends in parliament. Every time I have a debate, there are four or five people across the divide uh, from the Labour Party and Liberals and uh, the crossbenchers who will co contribute positively. Uh, we have a new chairman of in the Commons, Dr. Offord, and I hope he'd be able to do the similar thing in the Commons. And we have to be very alert. And uh, uh, your government, the Sri Lankan government, has to keep us well briefed. Uh, but I've no complaints on that at the moment. That seems to be happening. So, yes, not an easy road to go down. Thank you. Uh, some of the questions are actually emailed to us beforehand. Uh, so I have a question from uh, Mr. Arul Selvam from Toronto. Uh, his question is, you have completed a thorough investigation in Sri Lanka about the last stage of the armed conflict. Bill 104 in Ontario local council has provided supporting evidence for 146 and 679 as the death toll during the last stage of the armed conflict between LTTE and government of Sri Lanka. What is your finding of the investigation? I missed the middle, but I'm sorry, you went very faint. So um, uh, the, uh, Mr. Selvam is saying in the bill presented to um, Ontario local government called Bill 104, it uh -huh. claims that nearly 150,000 died during the last stage of the armed conflict and they have provided evidence to account for that. Well, you better send me a copy of it because it's just absolute rubbish. Absolute, unadulterated rubbish. So could I ask my friends in Canada, uh, particularly uh, Dr. Neville, be kind enough to send me that. If not, I'll ask the uh, Canadian High Commission to get me a copy. You see, this is where it all starts. You get something like that, it's then blown up by the media, it's then broadcast by the media. Before you know where you are, um, Madame Bachelet, who comes from Chile, uh, has picked it up and uh, it becomes gospel truth. And we have to deal with it urgently. So if someone will send it to me, the evidence, I'll have a look at it and pull it to pieces. Thank you. Uh, the next question is also from Canada. Uh, this says a gentleman called Liam Moore from Vancouver. He asked, um, have you found any link between liberation tigers of Tamil Lilam and uh, the current transnational government of Tamil Lilam, PGTE? So he's have asking I... if you have found any evidence of links between LTTE and PGTE. Uh, I, I haven't seen any uh, evidence in written form, no. Um, all I've seen or heard is that, yes, there is linkage. Um, so, no, I don't have any direct evidence. And that's not the sort of thing I would actually really investigate. Um, you know, I'm a single-handed man. 
and you keep me quite busy enough. <laughs> Can I just say to whoever it was that asked that, I have a dear brother who's on Vancouver Island, Crispin Morris. So uh, if you happen to bump into him, um, I've sent him the book <laughs> and his wife, his partner's read it and is also enthused about it. So at any rate, so kind of uh, regards to Vancouver. Thank you. Um, is it all right if I ask one more question yeah, uh, sure. before I move on to the next speaker? Um, this is from a lady called Champa Gunavardhan. Eh? Uh, she's, uh, she's asking, can you please tell how you see India's role on this issue? Have I seen? How, how you see India's role in uh, the ethnic conflict in Sri Lanka? I still haven't got the key word, sorry. Um, how, how you see India's role? How is India playing a role ah, in India. this conflict? Ah. Well, at this point of time, India has huge problems. And I don't think that now that Tamil Nadu, which in earlier times held the balance of power in the Indian government, and therefore what they wanted was really what the Indian government felt it had to implement which was not helpful to the UK, uh, to Sri Lanka. I don't think that situation pertains today. So I don't think uh, there's a problem with India as such. I can't see India wanting in any way to support uh, Elam or any version of Elam. I would just say one final thing, though, and in this area, where, where Sri Lanka is different to many other, certainly Western countries, is that uh, religion plays a key role. And we have to bring the religious leaders on side so that we do, they will, if you like, uh, agree that reconciliation is project number one. Thank you, Your Lordship. There are so many questions um, typed on chat and question and answers, but um, I'm gonna leave them to the tail end of uh, the discussion. Uh, I'm going to introduce the next speaker now. Uh, the next speaker, our last speaker is Dr. Neville Hevage. Dr. Hevage obtained his PhD from Laurentian University, Canada. He's currently working as an adjunct professor in law and justice and as a research fellow at the International Center for Interdisciplinary Research in law at Laurentian University. We got to know Dr. Hevage with his exemplary and inspiring work against the Bill 104, the genocide. Sorry. Um, the genocide education bill of the Ontario Legislative Assembly. His undeniable opposition is objective and evidence-based in the true nature of a genuine academic. We strongly believe his guidance will help immensely to guide resolution 30 slash one towards a long lasting peace in our motherland. The floor is uh, yours now, Dr. Hevage. Thank you very much. I think uh, you can hear me, right? Can hear you Dr. Hevage clearly. Yes. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, I am uh, addressing this uh, symposium uh, from uh, Canada, Ottawa, very close to the Capitol Hill and Parliament. And um, the my topic is basically then uh, we are going to discuss how withdrawal from the UN Human Rights Council Resolution 30-1 and how we can uh, affect for the inclusive uh, domestic reconciliation in Sri Lanka. So uh, prior to I want to get into that, I, I would like to request everyone to read uh, Lord Worship Nesby's book, Paradise Lost and Gain, and it's the publisher is a unicorn. Actually, there was a very nice uh, review uh, submitted by the uh, one of the Canadian scholar, and he said that this is the real uh, true history of the underwent through with the fight with the LTT and the government of, government of Sri Lanka. So therefore it is a real summary. Then I would encourage everyone to go and 
purchase that book and have a uh, to read it it is available on the amazon.com and amazon now uh, so my presentation i will uh, divide it into the few parts my first part is the brief history to the resolution then other part second section is the major issues on uh, for the legal issues from OSIL report and resolution 30-1 and how we can design domestically uh, design reconciliation how we can implement in the in sri lanka so when we look at the history of this uh, resolution it started from 2009 2009 and s11-1 and resolution introduced the assistance to sri lanka in promotion and protection human rights then after conflict in so we know that may 18th and may 27 that uh, resolution has been introduced then may 31st 2011 uh, report commissioned by the uh, narusman report that report published that is called panel of expert report at the request of of the uh, ban ki moon at the commission of the united uh, human rights council so then uh, 2012 they brought the another resolution 19-1 that is the they recall the s11-1 then they introduced 19-1 but so this process didn't stop they go further on 2019 and they introduce uh, 22-L.1, that the same promoting reconciliation and accountability uh, in Sri Lanka. Then 2014, the special development happened and uh, council issued the, another resolution uh, promoting reconciliation, accountability, and they included human rights position, human rights in Sri Lanka. So then uh, 2015, September 16, and uh, Commission uh, published the report, Investigation on Sri Lanka. Th that is commonly we referred as a OS I OISL report. So now uh, 2015, uh, September 28, you know that the, uh, soon after the government changes, everything happened and uh, the comprehensive report repaired October 1st and they have introduced the Resolution 30-1, promoting reconciliation, accountability, and human rights in Sri Lanka. So now, but actually in general public know about 30-1 resolution. But in addition to 30-1 resolution, uh, Human Rights Council brought rollover resolution 34-1 and 40-1. So therefore, in, if we want to study this, uh, what are the consequences of the 30-1 Resolution, we need to study together 34-1 and 40-1 together. Now, when we look at the applicable law and treaties to address this issue, there's a two, three instruments came into the power. So one is the one instrument is the international humanitarian law, second instrument, international human rights law, and Sri Lanka is a signatory for nine other human rights treaties but i'm not going to read all those things then uh, so this presentation will be published on the website then you can go and have a look at it so then in addition to that all person uh, uh, sri lanka is the, not the uh, sign, uh, signatory for the uh, protection of the all person from enforced disappearances now the major issue is come through the osil report with the methodology then if you have a not proper methodology is developed, the outcome of this uh, the report is completely false. That's what was to happen. Then, uh, so we know that uh, Human Rights Commissioner, uh, the Navi Pillin, uh, began the, the uh, investigation on July 1st, 2014. So according to the her, her report was the, on para 33, but I think we, we already published this uh, resolution on our website. If you have a chance, you can go there and uh, download that report. And uh, para 33, and she was telling, and the committee was saying, and reasonable ground to believe 
uh, so what is the standards of proof and they uh, put as a reasonable ground to believe. But para recommendation nine with the resolution 30-1, and they, they are asking uh, the criminal investigation for the civil war and uh, crime against humanity and genocide. So very lower threshold has been developed. Based on that, they are going for the criminal investigation. So we know that the competent lawyer, we very simply know that uh, if we want to go for the criminal investigation, it should be beyond reasonable doubt. That evidence should be applied on the balance of probability. So in that case, this evidence, this factor is only enough to uh, you know, uh, dismiss uh, the, this report. Now, uh, then I'm going to present some other information and a data collection issue with the, uh, the report methodology. And they have looked at the United Nations Operation Satellite Application Program detail because it is the war and fight between armed conflict between two parties. It is very difficult to get the narrative from the both parties, best way to look at the you know, satellite images. But they were not properly studied and there is no any single on the expert panel from the OSIL report. But we found the, the, the information. So we have studied very carefully with this matter and Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International requested American Association of Advanced Science uh, to, to review the satellite images on especially uh, civilian safety zone. And uh, so this is the zone, then I can, uh, uh, especially here, uh, point option highlight. Okay, so this is the area what we are talking about this, but actually this is the uh, war happened on that area, but they will look at the whole area. So this is the, the satellite images, what they have read. The, this satellite images are in uh, civilian safety zone structure, removed and moved civilians and created human shield by the LTT. Because that is the so one of the key factors, the human shield uh, created by this uh, LTT uh, by using the uh, Tamil civilian. It is clearly evident. Then other uh, evidence, so we have it. Uh, so how this uh, uh, they report, look at the, what are the graveyards they can find. And uh, they have found nothing, uh, they have found a uh, few uh, graveyards and, um, but actually graveyards, so they have found actually 1,340, uh, 1,346 uh, individual uh, burial site in that area. So it doesn't constitute for the genocide. They have, it, so it is the armed conflict. So now uh, other data collection issue came with the uh, panel of expert report. That expert report is a completely flawed. Then flaws, then I do not want to go any detail about this. It is not logical, no evidence-based, and only the based on assumption, there is no in-depth analysis on this report. But however, a panel of expert report is commissioned by the Darusman report is one of the key instrument used by the OSI report. Then when you look at the Darusman report, how they calculate the uh, debt total, they have come the number of 40,000. So how they come to number of 40,000, initially the population was in the one district is 330 and army rescue about uh, 200 and, uh, 290 and they subtract this number and 40,000. This war started in September 2008 and almost a year. So during that period, there is a huge uh, the civilian migration and they have never accounted that arbitrarily put the number. This number, Tamil diaspora, especially for the LTT diaspora and took this number and publicized the all over the world issue. It is a totally false claim. Then, then other data collection issue was uh, they have analyzed the photograph and videotape submitted by the pro-LTT group. Important thing is that when you submitted the videotape and uh, the photograph, we had to authenticate the, the photograph and video. They are the real actual pictures or they are doctored or the authentication of this uh, video. So we know that Bokus Channel 4 video and they have uh, broadcasted, but later on it was revealed that one. That is a completely doctored, called narrative by the Channel 4 video. 
now then uh, uh, so based on this uh, uh, forensic uh, uh, photographic and video evidence uh, so what this osi like report they they were pointed out the three few issues they all the civilians rather than they died the many many civilians they they never consider about all those things few pictures about this uh, for the civilian they were considered the uh, ltt senior political wing leaders balasingam nadeshan and seloratnam and nadeshan wife wife vinita nadesh and in addition to that they were considered they have provided the photograph of uh, colonel ramesh so it is on the paragraph 311 uh then then however those report they publish the, the report they publish on the osi report they were clearly mentioned that however further investigation it require to determine the full uh, accountability and what happened who was responsibility of the killing and it is subject to the forensic pathology so this court was there but anyhow uh, basically what happened was that they were crying and they want to justice and the ltt ltt group so they want to only the justify and for the justice for death ltt leadership and their uh, close association associate now then other issue that came on enforce or uh, involuntary disappearances so they had submitted that uh, to 12536 complaint but those complaint so as example uh, lord uh, worship uh, clearly mentioned that uh, they had to give the names of the uk government and the canadian government and all other authorities and they can find out the who is appeared reappeared again so that is the that mechanism has not to be done and ontario bill was claiming completely rubbish and 146679 but actually uh, lord nesby asked that uh, the report but there is no report it is a just uh, only the uh, the statement issued by this uh, 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 the sponsor of the bill and there is no uh, sufficient study is carried out to understand how the involuntary or enforced disappearances happen in sri lanka so then other issue the major issue came here that oisl report so as example so we know if you are going to see the doctor doctor has to identify the first the what is the cause of the disease so if the disease identified then he find the cause of disease and so we will do the treatment this osi report didn't identify the disease so what happened was there is uh, no legal definition for the this conflict so as example lord nesby highlighted that one it is the fight between ltt terrorist group and the democratically appoint government so this is according to the legal classification is a non international armed conflict during the non international armed conflict important uh, issue will come and play collateral damage and uh, no matter what the some reason this uh, osil report that the team completely ignore this the collateral damage and in addition to that uh, they didn't consider the the civilian movement uh, stop of the civilian movement not considered for the cause of the casualty then other important aspect i would like to mention to you here very importantly and uh, united Na nation convention for the prevention and punishment prevention and punishment of the geno uh, crime of the genocide and 1977 protocol 2 added that convention protocol 2 is clearly stated it has given authority to defend any action against states is come from the outside so this ltte arm struggle to complete the separate state is a clear clear action against the state it has been supported by the uh, genocide convention so those are the major legal issues so they have not considered so so what is the report card of the ltt and 7000 uh, you know child soldiers but i am not going to to mention all of the thing and um, then uh, the other important factor on the para 41 and uh, ltt group and uh, the, uh, this report has been given impunity for the terrorist organization 
how they given the impunity to the terrorist organization it was saying at the para 41 as the senior leadership of the ltt was killed end of the armed conflict oisil could not access the ltt for the direct information and so therefore uh, they are not responsible that is a completely nonsense that is the completely nonsense so then uh, based on the oisil report and seriously flawed and it has a contradiction so omission lies and everything is completely false and fail to establish for the primary complaint state is responsible and military as well as the uh, civilian leaders are responsible for the claim so uh, for the uh, for war crime and genocide and some other uh, allegation now how we can so now i talk about this to my the second part very quickly how we can bring the reconciliation we can bring the reconciliation through justice to sri lanka not only the tamil growth so there is the singhalis affected and the muslim people affected in addition to that according to the osl report ignore the other war criminal ltte war criminal should be extradited from their countries and has to have a criminal investigation of it adeli balsingham so one of the 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 leader then other one is the rudra kumar the currently parliament uh, um, L- tgt uh, prime minister and there is a uh, clear linkage between them with the prabhakaran and ltt associates and the uh, the rudra kumar and therefore they have to find uh, so they have to extradite to sri lanka and do the criminal investigation for them then in addition to that uh, recently very shocking the uh, uh, discovery came and uh, silon today uh, the n- newspaper published and um, uh, gary anand sangri sinhu gary anand sangri is the canadian uh, the politician and we were shocked to hear this uh, the the story and that uh, the report published on uh, 2 am september 5 uh, 2020 and uh, so this is the link and uh, it says gary anand sangri was in contact with the ltt chief procurement and shipping officer kumaram patmanabha uh, and planned to visit him malaysia after kp was arrested and deported to sri lanka he avoided that plan so but at this moment so that is the allegation and so we have no any linkage evidence so uh, we can establish so that is the published from the newspaper article but i would like to uh, uh, ask if this is correct or wrong and as a canadian we should know the truth and come out uh, the stage and please tell us so what's happened so this article is wrong or are you involved with or not so if it is the not then the kp is in sri lanka so that authorities can investigate and inquiry and find out uh, so what is the truth so but, but still it is on the allegation so, but so we know no and uh, i cannot establish the real connection uh, the, it is has to be done through the law enforcement agencies in canada now uh, that the 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 problem with the 30-1 and they were targeted for the uh, 30-1 resolution 19 amendment the, the the resolution wants to do the constitutional reform that is the uh, interfere, uh, interfere with the country sovereignty that is a completely is a problem and also then uh, they also wants to have a independent oversight the security system in sri lanka that is a completely interfere with the protection of the country and um, they also want to do the observation for the enforced uh, disappearances and um, but there is no credible evidence to find out proper investigation proper numbers but there was a seven uh, points but i am not going to establish each and every one the so one of the major issue is that uh, in order to implement 30-1 and roll over 341 and 40-1 the resolution asking to do the constitutional change that is a completely interview with the, uh, the domestic affairs of the country and uh, so now now uh, we need to find out the domestically developed solution so this is the solution we should find out and uh, we carefully examine i uh, we carefully studies of this uh, matter we are impartial and uh, we need to have a resettlement of the 
livelihood issues. So we need to find out. And in addition to that, shelter education problem and the child children without education in the Northeast because of the, the so this war and we need to provide them uh, education. In addition to that, there's a land claim issue. Basically land claim issue is comes from land mines planted by the LKT Tamil terrorists. And so they, they, they cannot uh, return into their original land. And um, so now 90% or maybe 95% over it is cleared, but eventually uh, that all the land will be cleared and hand over to the, the original owners. In addition to that, uh, then uh, because of the war, so there was uh, uh, widows and uh, disabled people and elderly person, and we need to take care of them. And the social system has to uh, stabilize and uh, people, we should integrate into the, the governance, but it is happening. And the 2015 election, over uh, uh, 10 Tamil political parties participated for the uh, election. And uh, not only that, that the concerns person in the Sinhalese villages, as example, uh, Lord Nesby studied 18,000 uh, uh, Sinhalese civilian that chased away from North and we had to bring the justice for them too. And not only that, the concern for the displayed Muslim and Sinhalese population. So we had to reestablish the, uh, so their livelihood. And finally, we had to promote investment in the North and East and bring the prosperity for the whole nation and whole uh, for the North and East. And we need to also identify the post conflicts uh, diaspora issue. So, as example, as somebody living in Canada, they have a property in Sri Lanka and they cannot trace it. So, we can help them to find out and they can. So, then we can start for the reconciliation process. This is the reconciliation process, domestically developed solution, what we have to implement. It is not a going to be then in order to improve this one, and we will go through this uh, 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 legislative changes. So, so we know that 70% of them are Buddhists and 12% of the Hindus. And so this is the uh, religious based country and everybody is support for the religion and none of the religion is promote the violence. So in that case, why we are not going to use domestically developed solution for the, the our country Sri Lanka? and forgive and forget. Then each and every religion is created to peace. Then forgive for right now, and 10 years after the, this incident in heaven, then still we are going to try to do the digging the stories and it hurt everybody, 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 everybody. And so therefore forgive and forget. And this, uh, so let's move on, come to the you know political participation, we can have a, religious based approach uh, to, uh, to find the uh, reconciliation and accountability in Sri Lanka. Uh, but I know that uh, there are uh, for a lot of questions and uh, so you can email to the, this uh, email. Uh, so then I will have a look at it. And then finally, I want to mention that, uh, please uh, read this book, uh, Lord Worship Nesby's book, Sri Lanka Paradise Lost and Regained and uh, uh, published by the unicorn and it is available on the Amazon dossier. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Sarah Chandra from the Canadian scholar write a very, very tremendous, um, uh, the, I mean, a, a review on this book. And he said, this is the best uh, the book and the best narrative. You can read the problem with the political and social analysis of the ethnic conflict in Sri Lanka. And uh, thank you very much. Then finally, I would like to say forgive and forget, and we have to move forward. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hevage, um, for dissecting the problem finely with your uh, academic scalpel and then uh, introducing and discussing potential blueprints for a future action plan in relation to the resolution 30 slash um, one. We at the uh, London Initiative look forward to working with you and your colleagues at Ontario Centre for Policy Research. Um, if I may, uh, Dr. Hevage, I have a pressing question. Uh, uh, you were talking about 
um, standards of proof, and then you were saying re, uh, that the proof was reasonable to believe, which was used at the UNHRC OISL report. What does that mean to a simpleton like uh, me? Uh, but actually, uh, so when we look at this, the uh, the, the criminal investigation, because the OSIL is going to do the criminal investigation against the civilians and the military personnel in Sri Lanka. So in order to establish the, uh, the threshold, and they had to have a bit, uh, beyond reasonable doubt, then the threshold they established the uh, reasonable to believe. And then other question is that from my side, I should ask what is the reasonable to suspect whatever information and so you have bringing. So it is a very, very low threshold. So that threshold cannot be applied. And therefore, the criminal investigation on part on the OSI report has to be dismissed right away so based on this uh, the, the fine. But if it is in the court, Canadian court, it, so it is the two minutes I want to go there and tell them the story is story is over. But it's, uh, there are other, the, the issues is there. So therefore, we need to address that. Thank you. Thank you, Neville. Um, I, I think uh, we are running out of time. Uh, the original plan was to finish this by half past five. And I don't know if I have all the panelists' permission to extend it for maybe 10 minutes extra. OK, 10 minutes. OK, thank you. Uh, so um, I think um, uh, before moving on, can I ask a question uh, posed by uh, a participant to uh, Mr. Paliyavadana. Um, he's asking, um, he, he has not mentioned his name, but he's asking uh, what London Initiative is and what its objectives are. Jairaj, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I, uh, yeah, it is. Um, I think uh, we haven't uh, given a good introduction about the uh, the organizing uh, uh, forum, uh, organizing this uh, webinar. Uh, just briefly mention uh, what this is. Uh, this is not another uh, nationalist uh, organization. This is uh, this, this the London Initiative is a public policy think tank uh, based in London. Uh, its mission is to make. Uh, impactful contributions towards policy making through high quality data driven research translated into innovative strategies to provide uh, useful recommendations for decision makers uh, this is a very technical term that i have been using because that is the how that is the good way of describing it uh, we mainly focus on policy issues uh, related to the minority communities in uk uh, this time uh, people this time we focus on sri lanka because that the resolution is coming up uh, another few months time so uh, because in sri lanka in the uk uh, the sri lankans are minority so this is uh, one issue relates to the sri lankans and the the idea is um, uh, because sri lanka is in the crossroads in establishing itself as an emerging economy within the region uh, in this text, uh, in this context, it is more important than ever before for policy making to take place in an informed and responsible manner. So bringing together expertise from around the world uh, is very good. That's why we thought. And we have a good platform, the up upcoming resolution. And um, there are irregularities. And the Lord Nesby was very vocal about this issue for a long time. So we thought um, this time, we we are going to focus on um, this um, resolution and the future of the Sri Lanka um, after March 2021 in the international forums like uh, UN UNHRC. Thank you, Jairaj. I think um, that that probably gives a good introduction. Uh, so uh, moving on to um, questions uh, uh, submitted under Q&A tab. Um, it's interesting to see that there are so many people from all over the world asking questions. This question comes from Switzerland. Uh, Mr. Ranil Jayanethi is asking, uh, this question is posed to uh, Lord Nesby. Sir, do you think Sri Lankan patriots should speak to German government? 
Any suggestions on how to do that? Do I think what? Do you think the Sri Lankan patriots all around the world should speak to the German government and any suggestions from you how we can start and do that? I do think people should uh, communicate with the, the government wherever they are. I worked in India, as you know, um, Canada and uh, Sri Lanka. Um, I was never afraid uh, if there was an issue to raise it. Uh, you will find wherever you live in Switzerland that there will be somebody who represents that uh, canton, I think it's called. Uh, go and have a word with him or her and express your concerns because Switzerland is a wonderful country. It's a peaceful country. Uh, it's long played a role in peacekeeping matters. Uh, the Geneva Convention is, is based on all that. So it's a very powerful uh, potential ally. So yes, please go and approach, start with your local representative, uh, ideally the one who's in the national parliament and see whether you can make some progress. Thank you. Uh, the next question is also to um, Lord Nesby. This is a question coming from the USA. Mr. Daya Gamage is asking, why doesn't the government of Sri Lanka's foreign ministry take a better interest in using strategic communication and public diplomacy to reach policymakers in Western countries? Well, that's a bit difficult for me to answer. <laughs> I'm not responsible for the Sri Lankan publicity. Uh, but I have said to the High Commissioner here, the new one, uh, that they do need to communicate better. Um, I come back to the point, you know, I spent 25 years in communication. And if you say something six times, you're lucky if they've actually heard it. And uh, of course, we have changes of government. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, changes at Foreign Secretary. Um, but at the moment, we've uh, stability. Uh, so yes, please, uh, the home team, if I can call it the home team for Sri Lanka, they need to pump out the material and make sure that their own high commissioners and ambassadors are fully briefed and do communicate with whichever country uh, they're serving at any point of time. Thank you. The next question is to Dr. Hevage. Um, uh, it's a question coming from Canada itself. It's um, a gentleman called Mr. Kasun Fernando from Edmonton. He's asking uh, Ms., uh, Dr. Hevage, do you see a link between Bill 104 submitted to Ontario Regional Government and UNHRC Resolution 30-1? Uh, yes, actually, I do see the clear link. So what happened was the 30-1 resolution is the basically is uh, come out with the uh, dead total, a genocide claim and the war crime claim. And in, in addition to that, Bill 104 also submitted to the Ontario Parliament based on the similar claim. So therefore, it is the clear linkage Then I can find out in between uh, uh, Bill 104 and Resolution 30-1. But important thing is that, important matter, I would like to highlight the Canadian authorities and the law enforcement agencies. So that's what we are continually advocating them this is they don't want to be they don't want reconciliation they want they don't want peace in sri lanka they want only to push the asylum policy in the particular country because uh, they are putting the pressure on the asylum policy in canada and the united kingdom and the usa but they are not putting that kind of pressure on the africa or maybe other is uh, you know uh, South Asian countries. So what they want to the, create the the environment and uh, pushing the the, the uh, lobbying the uh, you know parliamentarian in the UK and Canada and the United States and France and Germany. So the uh, Switzerland and the, they want to establish Sri Lanka is not a safer country for Tamils. Then they can bring a shift load of refugees. So that what was happened. And uh, recently there was a. Uh, one uh, boatload of 158 refugees came from 
and the 16 of them Sri Lanka and organized by the Tamil operative. So this is the, the situation. They, their idea is that to uh, the influence the asylum policy in the country. So th that is the business. I mean, uh, uh, bringing the human smuggling business is the most profitable business than the second to the narcotics and weapons. So that's what the LTTE and their proxies, so they want to do uh, the operator. There's a clear linkage in between Bill 104 and the 30-1 resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Neville. Um, this question is to uh, Lord Nesby. Um, the gentleman has not mentioned where he's posting from. Uh, it's from Mr. Tom Farrell. He's asking, uh, regarding the United States stance, what might the likely outcome of a B Biden victory in November for Sri Lanka? Uh, if, Joe, if Joe Biden wins, what will um, be the effect uh, for Sri Lanka? I fear not good news. Not good news. I think uh, we saw from Mrs. Clinton uh, that uh, she was... Uh, uh, not the least bit understanding, not the least bit helpful, and uh, they're two peas in a pod, as far as I can see. So, but uh, it, uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a groundswell here in the UK that suggests that uh, Mr. Trump may yet pull it off. <laughs> I just got that on. <laughs> the odds have shortened, put it that way, at the local bookies. <laughs> Let's hope for <laughs> Let's hope so for Sri Lanka's behalf. Um, uh, the next question is also um, to Lord Nesby. Uh, this is, uh, forgive me uh, for posting this question, uh, but uh, in the interest of freedom of information, I'm asking this question. This is uh, posted by a gentleman called James Wilson from Oxford. He's asking, do you think it's appropriate for a UK politician to get involved with foreign politics when there's plenty of issues to tackle on home soil? Well, I fought a marginal seat in Northampton South, and you don't win by 179 in the first election, or 142 in the second, if you've not got involved in local issues affecting ordinary people. But at the same time, we have a Commonwealth of Nations. Sri Lanka was a founder member of the Commonwealth. I believe in the Commonwealth. I think the Commonwealth should give a lead. And so, yes, I took an interest in the one country of two. Well, I took some interest in India as well. Uh, I took an interest in South Asia. And when I found Sri Lanka was facing problems, uh, I felt it my duty as chairman of the group uh, to take an active interest. And it's not just all politics. Uh, when the tsunami hit on Boxing Day 2004, my wife and I were in our TV room, and we both agreed that it was no point uh, my being chairman and sitting in, in Bedfordshire. So I rang the High Commissioner and said, could we come out and help? And we were out within 10 days, uh, and both she and I, she's a doctor, we helped a great deal. So that seems to me a cause that was well worth doing. Meantime, we've got the pandemic, and as that old gentleman likes to look it up, I spoke three times last week in the House of Lords on the pandemic. Thank you. Um, the next question is to Mr. Palihe Uh This is coming from Dr. Sarat Chandrasekhar in Canada. Uh, he asked, I have noticed that Tamil diaspora in England are politically active by forming Tamil Labour Party and Tamil Conservatives, etc. What have the other Sri Lankans done in this regard? Yeah, it is one of the issues I have addressed uh, during the last uh, webinar uh, organized by the Canadian uh, our pa Canadian partner. Um, actually, um, from uh, diaspora's point of view, it is very um, difficult scenario of when uh, Sri Lankan diaspora's point of view. It is a very difficult uh, scenario to get intervene directly. But um, there are instances that there are many organizations and um, many individuals uh, done tremendously, contributed tremendously um, 
towards tackling these issues coming from the uh, separatists. Um, it is uh, uh, important to know that um, uh, there are uh, we have identified that the, the there are the the UK is kind of a, a major port for uh, those uh, people uh, lobbying um, of uh, lobbying uh, the LTT terrorist supporters uh, lobby um, center for their separatist agenda to, con to go through their separatist agenda. So we all aware that the LTT terrorist war in Sri Lanka has been lost. However, the London Tamil terrorist supporters are still committed to the dream of their own Elam state. In other words, we can say Tamil Tigers defeated at home, but defined a board. So um, it is uh, even the war in Sri Lanka has been lost. London Tamil terrorist supporters are still uh, pursuing uh, their separatist dream. So it is, uh, uh, there are different uh, ways of activate, but uh, the, the, the way uh, they have to operate is very limited. So uh, what uh, we expect from the Sri Lankan government is take some initiative uh, because it is not just tackling the terrorism ideology, it is uh, going towards the peace process when the people are disturbing the peace process in Sri Lanka. And uh, there is a big difference between what uh, Sri Lankan Tamils wants and the Tamils living in other countries wants. There is a big difference. That difference is the main hurdle to uh, go forward with the uh, reconciliation and harmony. So there is a need from Sri Lankan government to initiate some kind of a action plan to go ahead with uh, tackling uh, the problems in uh, separatist diaspora issues in countries like Sri Lanka, uh, England, Canada, and Australia. Thank you, uh, Jairaj, for that. Uh, the next question is to uh, Lord Nesby from, uh, this is coming from Dr. Mark Disanaika. Um, in London, uh, he's saying, thank you, Lord Nesby, for your very precise evidence-based speech. In spite of undisputable evidence, why are countries like UK, USA, Canada, and Europe having explicit evidence they continue to hang up against Sri Lanka? I don't really know the answer to the problem. <laughs> I'm as amazed as anybody. Um, I always get ministers saying, well, of course, one death is one death too many, uh, which is a ridiculous answer, frankly. Um, so we can but hammer away. Um, the truth must come out uh, because we want to live in peace. And that's what that's the message that hopefully if anything good comes out of the pandemic, it is that the people want to live in peace and have uh, families and uh, work and enjoy life and look after each other. So maybe that's the uh, the only benefit that will come out of the pandemic. But if it does, then that's a great help. I'm going to have to depart in a minute. Thank you. Um, uh, the Maybe we'll have room for one or two last questions. Not two, one, and then I must go. So okay. I another appointment. Right. So this, this uh, I thought of finishing with one last question uh, where all panelists can answer, and we'll uh, maybe start from Doctor um, um, start from Lord Nesby. This question is from uh, Sam Prasad in Newcastle upon Tyne. He asks, in your opinion. How best can Sri Lankans inside and outside the country coordinate their efforts to manage the UNHRC resolution, protecting their motherland and all its citizens from many adverse effects of the resolution? Over to you, Lord Nesby. Well, there are some wonderful organizations. Um, this organization that has put this on today uh, has a very active UK base. We've just heard called the London Initiative. Um, if um, there are a number of other ones uh, around the countryside, make sure you're in contact with uh, the High Commission in London. They are active. Um, and uh, 
we work with your friends who are Sri Lankans or who take an interest, or people who take an interest in Sri Lanka, because um, you're much more powerful when you work as a group than if you work just as individuals. Um, so I say good luck to everybody. Um, it's a very, very just cause and a wonderful country. And we want all of us want to see peace and reconciliation and goodwill. And uh, I will do my bit. Um, I enjoy it. It's, uh, I've had very happy memories there. Good friends across the divide. My best friend is a Tamil. So that is. And I got Sri Lanka test cricket. So there we are. Thank you for inviting me tonight. Lovely session. Well done to everybody who's taken part. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Nesby. Uh, I'm going to apologize uh, for those who have asked questions and uh, we, we just have to wrap things up because of the time constraints. Um, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to Lord Nesby, Dr. Hevagi and Mr. Palihavadana for spending their precious weekend time with us today. A big thank you also to all of you who joined us from all over the world to make this event a success. Uh, we nearly hit the 100 mark. Uh, we can continue the discussion on social media platforms as we will be sharing these videos of today's webinar on Facebook and Twitter. On behalf of all the organizers, I wish you all a very nice evening. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.